Make sure you check out our online store where we work with our graphic designer to create stunning garment and product designs that feature a wide variety of aircraft types such as British fighters, World War II aircraft, American bombers, Russian fighters and much more. You can pick your favourite designs and personalise any items within our Redbubble store that range from clothing right the way through to stationery. All of our designs feature our logo so you can show your support for the channel while getting a quality product. You can head to our website aircrewinterview.tv and click store or go to redbubble.com forward slash people forward slash AC interview. Thank you and enjoy. The squadron first went to Bosnia, um, so we're based at um, Banja Luka Metal Factory. It wasn't, um, you know, it, it wasn't the, the most exciting flying per se. There's some interesting, um, you know, mountain flying. Uh, we did a lot of weapon collection, etc. But um, I took um, there's a model, American model called Caprice, who um, came out, did a, a, a tour around, and uh, we took her flying one day. Uh, we took her flying in a magician and it was it was quite funny whenever we took around all these patrol bases and what was really funny to me was we, we'd land on the patrol base and uh, we took the aircraft down and all the troops would come rushing over and you know they hadn't seen a woman in three months and they would cluster around Caprice and they'd talk to her and the guy would be just doing a couple of magic tricks in the background and people would just filter away from the Caprice and this magician guy is absolutely brilliant it's like a David Blaine type chat and they couldn't get enough of him and I remember Caprice she'd be there and every time it was the same five minutes Devlin would be ignoring her, all these sex staff squaddies would be kind of <laughs> clustering around this bloke and she'd be standing there bored out of the school so we'd talk to her. Uh, but we flew into this base called Sipovo and um, I wasn't flying. Um, there's a friend of mine called Phil who's now a pilot in the Canadian Air Force and the Merlin had a really strong downwash. Um, if you look at the rotor blades they've got kind of paddles at the end and they produce a really concentrated like a, a donut ring effect. And also it's a very heavy helicopter as well, sort of 15 tonnes. Um, so it produces you know 400 miles an hour of 15 tons worth of downwash it's uh, horrific awesome. and when flew uh, when phil flew into the patrol base he flew over um this house and there was a little cd alley outside every base and that was where guys sold the hooky dvds and you know in air crew we were always up for a bargain so we'd always go out and buy a few hooky dvds and cds and everything as well uh, so phil basically flew in flew quite close to this house in the cd alley uh, you know caprice and the magician guy went off to do their magic tricks and their you know meet and greet and I just thought, hey, I'll go out and buy a few few music CDs. So I went out the main gate, and um, there's a crowd of very angry people there. And I, I had second thoughts about going out at this stage, and then one of the guards came out to me and goes, are you the pilot? And I said, kind of. You know, I thought, I'm not going to argue about being co-pilot or pilot. <laughs> and he said, they want to speak to you. And I go, OK. So I went over to them, and you know, I made sure I had an escape behind me. And they basically mainly were ex-Serbian soldiers. And when, we, when Phil had been flying, he flew in and blew over most of their CD shacks. Oh, so no. they were not happy at all. <laughs> so I had to do a lot of apologising on their behalf. And obviously I didn't go and buy any dodgy CDs at that stage because I thought I'd get lynched. Yeah, probably <laughs> wise right there, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, we took, we took it to um, Iraq after that. That was, that was very different. That was a very different place to go. Um, you got shot at pretty much every time you went flying. It was, it was just simply incredible. I mean, you generally only saw it at, at night time. And, you know, I still remember very clearly that, that the first time that um, I was shot at, I was flying with this um, really nice um, new pilot called Ryan. He's now a wing commander. I was, um, you know, second tourist, experienced pilot, 2,000 hours, a qualified helicopter tactics instructor. You know, thought I knew it all. Clearly, I didn't. <laughs> we, were, we were flying over Baza at um, just under 3,000 feet. I remember it was dark on the ground, so it was, you know, it was early morning, like half past five or something. But the sky was lightning, and I assumed nobody would see us. And, uh, and obviously we stuck out like a sore thumb against the, the sky, but I thought we were so high nobody would, would shoot at us. And we were flying along just having a nice chat, and suddenly these, this razor, it looked like a red-hot laser beam, just shot in front of the aircraft. And I was just <laughs> completely stunned, and I, I just... I, didn't know what to do and I remember Ryan you know this brand new brand new co-pilot said uh, are, are we meant to like maneuver now or avoid this and I went yes you know <laughs> at that stage you know he kind of totally shot me out of my um you know my, my my state but it was just such a surprise that anybody would be able to see us that high and to get so close to us yeah. and obviously the, the problem with the tracer of course is you know that generally it's not one in one you've not got one you know tracer per bullet there might be one round of tracer and there's five other bullets that are coming just behind it so uh, yeah, so generally you only saw it at, at night time. Uh, probably the, 
the most disturbing incident I had over there was I, I didn't see a thing that happened. So we were in um, a place called As-Samawa, which is up in the northwest of Iraq. And we were asked to do a, a photo reconnaissance task and they wanted us to go um, quite low, but there's a certain minimum height that you know, we, we say you shouldn't go below. It's like the main threat band for, for small arms. And we stayed above that. And we're flying around the middle of this town for about an hour and a half while this guy took photos and uh, never saw a thing the whole time. And uh, we're the only aircraft in the area. And next day when I got back to, uh, to Basra, I was re reading the intelligence reports. And I read this intelligence report for Asamara for the day before. And it said a Merlin was flying around the town for an hour and a half. And there were, I think it was 150 gunmen in cars following it, no shooting way. at it. And it absolutely sent shiver down my spine. I thought you hadn't a clue. We you? literally had no clue because it was daytime as well. We yeah. never saw a thing, you know, I mean, it, and that was the that was the scary thing for me was you know we had no idea this was happening um, we were also uh, we engaged at a few times by uh, missiles so we had a uh, heat seeking missile fired at us one night uh, that was that was just incredibly quick how, how quickly it was over so I was um, flying with a friend of mine called Luce around the southern edge of Basra and we were doing a, a night low level flight uh, 150 foot and um, the crewman just screamed, he screamed and at that stage the, the alarms went off, we had some um, internal alarms in the aircraft with, um, which detected heat seeking missiles, the flares all ejected and you know you, you try and find out what's going on because you don't know where the threat is, I said what's happened, he said it's just missed us and, was, <laughs> and at that stage we, you know, I knew by now I needed to move the helicopter so we, we got as far away as we could and I uh, asked him what had happened and he said basically a missile just appeared and shot behind the aircraft, obviously the flares worked, it's an automatic flare re release but it, it was over instantaneously it was over like that so you know it just and this the the, 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 the this was uh, January January 2006 and in May 2006 I was um, I was getting changed at a wedding it was my sister-in-law's wedding and I, I saw in the news that an, an aircraft had been shot down in in Basra and uh, it was actually my boss at the time John Coxon um, it was a Lynx that had been shot down there was John Coxon a friend Sarah Jane Mulverhill there were five of them killed and they were shot down by heat seeking missile and it was the same area where we were uh, and they, they used to work in teams and you know it kind of I don't know whether it's the same team that shot at us that got him yeah. or not but it was it, it, again shivers down my spine that that was you know probably the same people and they got lucky lucky with him and unlucky with me Crazy. So, um, yeah some incredible stories <laughs> yeah it was it was um it was a funny place I mean we we spent um a lot of time in a place called Alamara, which was an old uh, Republican um, Rep uh, Iraqi Republican army base, and it had the dubious pleasure of having the cookhouse built above um, a sewer, a sewer or something. So you would you would go into eat, and it's just the most revolting smell you could ever smell in your life. The uh, you know you had portaloos there, which you can imagine a portaloo in 35 degree heat it was it was ridiculously unpleasant. But um, I remember the first time I landed in Alamara, uh, the Sea Kings were based there at the time as well. And we landed on the pad behind the Sea King. And um, all the, the aircraft had HESCO around them, if you, if you know what that is, the, the big containers that are filled with gravel to stop blast fragmentation mm -hmm. and things. And there basically was a rocket stuck in one of those <laughs> containers because they, they were rocketed in the base most nights. And yeah. um, I'd never experienced it before. I mean, the first night we were there, the ground crew were working there on the top of the Merlin, which is I don't know, 20 foot up in the air and people started firing at them from outside the base and then I think it was two nights later I, I was in my um, <coughs> mosquito net and I've always had a, a phobia with mosquitoes I absolutely hate them drive me mad and um, I had this mosquito net full of holes and I heard this zzz, zzz, like that and I got my newspaper out and I was trying to smack the mosquito right. and um, then the mortar alarms went off <laughs> and it obviously wasn't a mosquito it was these rockets that were being fired at the base wow. and they had just missed our hardened uh, accommodation we were staying in so yeah, that was another close call, but they obviously, because they're going so fast, they, uh, I think they landed about two miles away, so uh, <laughs> even though they probably came within 10 or 20 feet of our, our base, but uh, yeah, it was an interesting place to, to fly around.